Asia's best business minds and personalities with nowhere to hide and no way to avoid the questions. A captive interviewee for 30 minutes on board the Singapore Flyer. Welcome to High Flyers with Haslinda Amin. Flyers, the interview show with a different perspective. With a wide range of assets spanning from Europe to Australia, Malaysia's YTL aspires to be the next General Electric. Meet its managing director, Francis Yeo. Francis Yeo wanted to drop out at 16 to help his father's construction company through tough times. It was his father who persuaded the young Francis a good education was a far better long-term investment and scraped up enough money to eventually send him to university in Britain. Now, four decades later, Francis Yeo has grown YTL into one of Malaysia's biggest conglomerates. The group's interests include Britain's Wessex Water, energy companies, luxury hotels in France and across Asia, upmarket shopping malls, and a new 4G mobile network. Francis Yeo is known as a flamboyant character with a love of opera. But when it comes to investment, he says he's benefited from being boring. If you are not a CEO that is judged by the tyranny of quarterization and your bonus is depending on the sales and your share price, then you can adopt long-term strategies like I did. But if, you, uh, if the shareholders uh, demand that you do something no matter what, to do any business or grow, no matter what at any time and every quarter, I don't know how we're going to buy businesses at uh, valuations that are ridiculous. So I've always told my shareholders, be patient, be patient, and uh, we'll, we'll always get them. And every time there's an economic implosion, our business just grew and grew and grew. It's grew 55% compounded. Our sales this year is 6.5 billion US dollars, and our profits, net profits, has uh, reached 350 million US dollars in a difficult time like that because all these businesses has got long-term sustainable dividend will cash flows and profits and that's that's what I like boringly exciting profit companies but to the world of short-termism and and quarterization we are boring they love this exponential growth companies every quarter not a sexy company for sure but a profitable company yes we're a profitable company and we'll be profitable for a long time to come that is exciting what's the greater plan for your utility business because you have assets all over the world including Australia including the UK Singapore as well you own a third mm -hmm. of the production here well energy and energy a total energy company is not just a generator. We are in all three areas now, transmission, distribution and generation and energy. So we like to be an energy, total energy player and there are a lot of scope from natural gas to shale gas to many areas. So it's, it's an interesting world. We have to keep continuing to find alternative fossil fuels that are not as destroying the environment as it is now. But how big will your business be? Because right now 60 percent of your sales come from the energy business. Uh, well, it's a good business to be, but you have to be uh, very competitive, but it's increasingly very difficult and challenging to manage. Why is that? Because of the fuel prices. We're now with quantitative easing, uh, if you're not well hatched, you just like airlines, you know, you'll be caught in, um, in the energy prices going too far north, too far south, and if you don't hatch it well, you're, you're not going to make profits, and consumers won't pay a lot of money for, for electricity forever. You know, so there will be political repercussions. So it's not an easy business to do when you're a merchant plan and, and the public is your buyers of electricity. So you supply to them and, and you have to listen to them. So it's, it's not as easy going into the future. One of the sweetest deals you've had must be Wessex Water, which you bought from Enron when yes. it was crumbling. You paid $1.8 billion. Yes. Enron itself paid $2 billion. It's now worth $3.5 billion. Can you get such deals? It's been such a profitable business venture. Yes. Uh, again, when we bought it at a time from Enron, it was a top 10 company. 
And the reason is a top company today and very profitable and the regulated assets have grown in a huge base now and it's worth that much is because our people understand our DNA. We told all the management and the staff, we are not going to sell you. We are going to keep you. But there's one caveat, all right? We want you to be the top company, water company, not the top ten. All right? That's the quid pro quo. We'll keep you, we'll give you time, but we want to build it the best water company. And we give you stocks, right? Stock options. And they couldn't believe it. And that's, that's how we do it. Everywhere. That's the whole DNA of YTL. Sustainable. We're not going to buy, polish, and sell. We're going to keep good companies. When you bought Wessex, the Herald came up with a headline saying, Who are YTL? No, it better rhyme. Who the hell is YTL? <laughs> <laughs> the British are very good at headlines. And, 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 and you, you came back with a move that made sure people knew who you were. You flew the three tennis to Bath yeah. in answer to that. That is a fantastic uh, evening. That's a fantastic evening. A celebration? A celebration. And it touches people a lot. I've got, up to today, lots of letters from people in the uh, bath. They just, so incredible that evening. They, up to today, they won't forget it. Coming up, taking his father's advice. It's either <laughs> when it's like that, okay, you know that it's going to do very well. After spending most of his early life on building sites, Francis Yeo felt ready to join his father's construction company at the age of 16, willing to sacrifice his education for the sake of his siblings. Eight years and a university degree later, Francis entered the company with the ambition of turning around the ailing industry. Locked into the Singapore Flyer for 30 minutes, we asked Francis Yeo about the early days of financial strain and his father's influence on his career. The company, YTL, is named after your father, Yeo Tiong Lei, yes. who is also still the chairman of the company. Yes. How much involvement does he have in the running of YTL? Well, we go to him for advice when we want to do a big deal. It's either <laughs> like that. When it's like that, okay, you know that he's going to do very well. So his wisdom and his experience still, his nose is still very sharp, right? But not day to day, not day to day. Well, he, he, he still, uh, his habit, by force of habit, he started since 13, he's never stopped. So he liked to go to the construction site still and, and, and wake everybody up, you know, and, and still look for stuff. He's still very interested. He did the right thing to educate the kids in England. So when I wanted to quit and join him at 16, at that time, times were tough, like one of these Chinese families, the elder son quit and, and let the other younger brothers go to school, stuff, said nothing doing. That is silly. That, that's not a good idea because if you do that, then there's no future. He said, you, you can't work as hard as I or grandpa. So it's not about hard work. It's about being able to change the business and being able to adapt with the business uh, that is moving in a different direction. How so, difficult was it though? Take us through those times because you were sent to school after your dad managed to yeah, garner enough yeah, funds to send you to the, yes. to, to the UK. There must have been a lot of pressure on you to perform because he expected you to come back to make a difference to the company. Yes, a lot because not only that I'm the eldest son and I've got uh, uh, six... The eldest of, uh, of seven, seven siblings. Yeah. And I have to show an example by graduating with an honors degree in uh, civil engineering so that they will all follow suit. I want them, them all to be civil engineers. <laughs> Most of them became civil engineers. Why though? Because we wanted to build a technologically uh, strong engineering company as a base. Because it started as a construction company. That's it. So stick to our core competency. But the difference is that I felt confident that we could uh, harness change. Before change hit us, we could change an industry, construction industry, which was a a uh, terrible industry. Nobody invested in people or machines at that time because you never know where, where's your next contract coming from. So nobody invested in it. It's always a very temporary business. Yet, despite your background in civil engineering, one of your first projects was to venture into a resort. <laughs> What's the thinking behind that? There's no luxury in engineering. It's a very boring business. If I say a bridge is going to stand 100 years, 
it will stand a hundred years. There's no speculation. It's, we are not artists, we are scientists. So we like to extend our scope a bit to architectural, to landscaping, to interior design. So it's out of boredom, but similar to engineering, but more to do with with uh, value add of lifestyles, so we went into hotels just to add a bit more fun to what we do. Still need the old and core skills of engineering, but you can then have architects and interior design and, and, and build places to serve people. I like hotels because for me it's the most humbling business. We it's a difficult and competitive business. That's what I like it. I, it's the sense of stewardship of God's assets. It's a sense of service. I like us to stay on the ground. And it's not easy to make money on hotels, but I've got a fantastic team, very passionate. Uh, and we've got so many years of experience of losing money in the wrong way. We've learned some mistakes. So we've learned how to make money out of hotels. Always never cut corners and always give the best. Enhance assets where people really love. We love all of that, uh, all of that experience to serve people. And no matter how big we are today in all our business, I will always like to, to do some hotel and expand that because it's a business that serves people. Standing here today, it's hard to imagine that YTL has made mistakes, mm. but it has. You yeah. have a museum of mistakes. That's right. Tell us. I think the, we were very blessed that we made mistakes, but not big ones. So much so that the culture of being careful and prudent and it works, that is almost quite a DNA of YTL. They, they are not going to come up with silly ideas anymore today, I can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> so today, uh, less and less, uh, and as the company grew to such a size, uh, today we are talking about turnover of uh, 18.5 billion ringgit sales. So you can make serious mistakes today if, if we have not had that early uh, museum of mistakes where we experimented with uh, maverick ideas. So it's very good when the siblings were young, they wanted to have ideas. Uh, they probably thought maybe construction is too boring and too restrictive, but everybody understands now to stick to our core competency on infrastructure, do what we know best around anything. So we are an engineering company, so we can build things, anything that has got an engineering element, we can do. Coming up, becoming a pioneer of life-changing technology. My grandchildren's generation would curse us if we had an opportunity to do 4G and we didn't. While Francis Yeo was growing the YTL conglomerate, Malaysia was implementing controversial economic policies which favored Malays, or Bumiputras. Locked into the Singapore flyer for 30 minutes, Francis Yeo talks about rolling out the world's first nationwide 4G network and answers the tough questions about business ties with Malaysia's former Prime Minister, Mahathir Mohamad. Malaysia is known for its affirmative action, a policy that favors the ethnic Malays, yet it has not stopped you, an ethnic Chinese, from doing really well. What went right for you? I listed the company in 1986. Uh, I told my father, we must grow together and create the economy. If the economy is too black and white, it's very difficult. Uh, there was a, a, a big economic divide. And listing the company meant at that time giving 30% shares to Bumi Putra. So hopefully they will do well uh, as a, a vested interest uh, in their enlightened self-interest to see you grow. And that worked very well for YTL as we grew. And uh, ever since then, uh, we've grown to be a global company. Now 75% of our revenue is outside Malaysia. What works really well as well is the fact that you know the right people. The right people in high places, not to mention the former Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamed, yes. who did help you along the way. Well, that's not criticism as you probably try to allude to, it is not like that. Mahathir actually welcomes uh, entrepreneurship. He's a very clever man. He just knows that the, 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 the private sector are the engines of growth. And he wants the private sector to make money. Be Bumi Putra, Nam Bumi Putra, or Chinese or Indian or Eurasian, it doesn't matter. Why? Because the government will tax him 30% at that time. You know? so, if he makes money, the government makes money. But you had a big break back in, I think, 1982, when there was a nationwide power outage, and Mahathir decided, okay, enough is enough. 
I need someone more reliable to, to get the electricity going in the country. Yes. And you were awarded the, uh, the contract yes. to supply power. Yeah, at that time, because uh, Dr. Mahade already acknowledged the prowess of some of our local construction companies. And then he gave us an opportunity when the privatization, he thought of uh, government shouldn't be in business. So let the private sector grow it. So if they make money, so what? I'll tax him 30%. So it's <laughs> very simple for him. So uh, he encouraged all of us to do that. Yeah. You're known as a very prudent businessman, but also a flamboyant personality. Is there a contradiction in that? Uh, flamboyant because I'm always in the face of people changing and doing business models that have not been done, financing things that have not been done and always believing in it, like an evangelist in it. So it's always in the face of people. People find that flamboyant. But I, I'm just trying to tell the truth and just telling people, give me a break. I know it can be done. It's quite commonsensical. Just because it's never been done before, why can't we do it? 4G is the same, you know, the 4G spectrum that we have. Unbeknownst to many people, for example, today, Malaysia has the most advanced fourth generation communication network in the world. But how much of a game changer will 4G be? Because you've likened it to be a color TV compared yeah. to a black and white. Yeah, that is phenomenal. You know, the world in a couple of years will have smartphones. And smartphones want internet, right? They want a Wi-Fi or internet. And they prefer a 4G, where it's 10 times more powerful than a 3G, right? They don't want a Wi-Fi best effort basis. They want a network that can give the power of the devices to work the way it should work, the apps that are awesome today. But the network around the world is not supporting actually Steve Jobs' dreams, right? We are the first in the world to do that. So given the huge potential of 4G, what will that mean for YTL? Will that change in, uh, in terms of contribution of profit? Yes, I think so. I like all things we've invested. Everything we do, in the beginning, people always laugh a bit, ridicule it a bit, knock it a bit. And if it worked, they say, well, it was political connection. <laughs> Never mind. That has to be Been a reason. Done, that seen it. It's okay. <laughs> but I, I think this is, to me, very important. My grandchildren's generation would curse us if we had an opportunity to do 4G and we didn't. YTL is just one of few Malaysian companies that have gone global. What is hindering? more Malaysian companies from taking the same route? No, I don't think Malaysian companies are being hindered. You talk about uh, Genting, they are very global. Uh, Petronas is a very global company. Uh, Sam Davis is a very global company. But, not... but you can count them. There, there, there's so few of Malaysian companies that have gone global and made an impact on the global scene. There will be more. We've set the trend. Many people have set the trend. I think going global, being a trading nation, should be a, a normal thing. But, uh, what are the challenges for Malaysian companies when they venture overseas? Well, they, they have to have the skill sets and intellectual capital, and they have to invest in them. They have to understand the rule of law and regulatory framework. And that's something that the YTL, to a certain extent, has done quite well. We, we do businesses in areas where the regulatory framework is very transparent, like in Britain, Australia, and Singapore. So that's not a coincidence. We actually thrive in, in, in the economies where the regulatory framework rule of law is a way of life. And uh, Asia is not like that, unfortunately. So Malaysian businesses are quite used to the old way of uh, know who rather than know how, and, and they get stuck a bit. And then time just passes by. Some get away with it, but mostly uh, most people will not be able to adapt to a changing, uh, very big change in the, in the world economy today. Coming up, being guided by faith. If you do the right thing, the results will follow. The economic goodies will follow if you do all the right things. That is a simple formula. YTL Group's Francis Yeo has spent four decades building the company into one of Malaysia's biggest conglomerates. He is also an opera-loving man, known for flying in famous singers whenever there's an occasion to celebrate. Francis Yeo joins us in the Singapore Flyer and tells us about the guiding force in his life, which he believes will also guide future generations.
You're known for your business acumen, but you started really young at the age of 24, right after school. At that time, what made you think that you have what it takes, that you can bear all the responsibilities coming your way? My faith in God, I'm a Christian. I suppose we but are optimists. at 24? I think the moment you become a Christian, you are an optimist already. You think of the long term, you have a sense of eternal life. So these are all the perspectives, the long term ideas of business models, sustainable models. And, and yes, so the confidence was always there. If you do the right thing, the results will follow. The economic goodies will follow if you do all the right things. That is a simple formula. But it takes a lot of discipline to keep focused and stay that way. I want to talk about the next generation. You said much is given, but much is expected. Yes. That's biblical. If you are blessed, then you must give. See, our God is a giving God, so you, whatever you do... They you're... choose to fail for your kids, all five of them. We tell them, you are the stewards of the next generation, but things are dynamically changing so much. Technology, digital economy, you guys can handle it much better than us. All right? We build a strong foundation. We can understand building the infrastructure of the engineering side of the digital economy very easily. But the digital economy, the cut and thrust and the change and the language and the bites and all this, the way they speak the new lingo, wow, well, you guys are more adept at it, you know. So, go... So you're confident your business is in good hands? Very good hands because they are very strong godly foundations. You've said all your kids must speak three languages. Yes. The language of God, the language of man, the language yes. of machine. In that order. So the language of God is to have integrity and morality. And if you, are, you don't have that, nothing, nothing is sustainable. And then the language of man, you have to articulate. Like if, uh, if you can't speak English properly, you have great ideas, you cannot champion that idea and get all the people to be behind you, it's, it's difficult. And then harnessing technology, that language machine is zero and one, you know. If you cannot handle it, you will never be able to make it. So you have a succession plan? Yes, I have a succession plan. They will have to compete with all the CEOs of the world. And if they make it, they'll be a CEO. How would you like to be remembered? You've done so many things. What's the one thing that you've done that gives you great pride in? Well, I, I don't think about such a being remembered. If you look at our balance sheet, we have uh, in YTR, we say the journey continues. And that's pretty big, big in one sense. The journey continues means I run a good race. I do not drop the baton. That's all I do. I do not say I'm the generation that hits the tip. And then that's it. There's nothing more. This is my legacy and that's it. Right? And there's nothing more to do. There are lots more to do. So my understanding of how I work is to tell everybody that our journey continues as long as we are given this baton, don't drop it, right? Just pass the baton to the next generation and hope that they run with it very well. So I don't think about what I do and how great it is. I don't have the luxury to think of that. Tantra Francis Yeo, thank you so much for being on High Flyers. Thank you. Pleasure. Right. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.